My reality of my childhood was, it was pretty normal. I, think, I, I thought it was a pretty normal childhood. I realize now, when I look back, our family was pretty insulated, very closed off, insular. There was a feeling that we were a little better because of our religion. Our religious belief was Christian science and there was a, uh, there was a, uh, the concept of Christian science is, you're, you're using all of the, the God's power to heal you. You don't believe in doctors. You don't believe in uh, dentists even. You don't believe in anything uh, around health class or anything right. physical like that. You're learning every subject in the classroom. And, okay, get out your health books, and I would have to leave. My reality was that, you know, when you're standing in the hallway, you're in trouble, you know, and teachers are looking at you funny, and, you know, you're getting the just getting the bad vibes from people. Yeah. And I'm out here because my parents told me a little speech to say about our religion and why. And um, I didn't believe it. I didn't, I didn't believe it or understand it. So when people would say, you know, oh, this and that, and we believe this, and you know, my dad would kind of roll his eyes and say, no, we don't, we don't believe in that. And you know, when he would read from the Bible, he'd get teary eyed and it would be so emotional. And I would wonder why I don't get any of that. What's wrong with me, you know? Am I supposed to be like him? Uh, uh, well, I wanted to learn about all things and, it, it, and I wasn't really allowed to do that. Well, I think the wound was that we're, I'm different than everybody else and no one will ever, ever understand what I'm thinking. And so that's one of those things that obviously have shown up in some lyrics. Dear mother, dear father, what is this hell you've put me through? Believer, deceiver, Day in, day out, live my life through you. Pushed onto me what's wrong or right, hidden from this thing that they call life. My other belief about my family is it, it fell apart. It disintegrated and I knew nothing about it. I didn't know it was happening and I wasn't the man. I wasn't taught to step up and take control of the family and say, hey, wow, this is going on. The thing that hurt me most and when I look back at it, I get really mad that my dad just, he left without saying goodbye. He left a note. He left a note. And it wasn't even to me. <laughs> and I fucking hated him for that. And I let him know. Did you? Yeah. And my sister couldn't believe how I was talking to my dad, you know? She's like, what are you doing? You're talking to him like that. It's like, I don't care. Right. You know, he screwed us. <laughs> when my father left, I was 13, my mother passed away, I was 16. I blamed him for that. I blamed him for my mom passing away. Um, obviously the Christian science religion is you don't go to the doctor. She, she died of a cancer that just we watched her wither away, me and my sister. It was a big blur, a big blur all of that. Yeah. You know, f all through high school. I went straight into the drinking so it was I masked a lot of, a lot of feelings of, of abandonment. Once the abandonment happened, and once I really got a deep anger for my father and my mother passed away, I had some f couple of close friends that were, I was pretty close with, but not to the fact, or the point where you could sit down and say, man, my mom died and I feel like this. You know, there was none of that. There was, there was no funeral. There was none, no grieving part. Uh, that's another part of the religion that just, it, it, it didn't do well for me. I see faith in your eyes. Never you hear the discouraging lies. I hear faith in your cries. Broken is the promise. Betrayal, the healing hand held back by the deepened nail. 
Follow the God that failed. I feel so weird saying this, but I, I, I really tried to, to get close with him again, get back together, and, and I, I bought him a house so I could go visit him. And it's like, why did I do that? Why? You know, am I supposed to do that? <laughs> you know, guy, rockers, when they get money, they buy their parent the house they wanted. Yeah, we'd go hunting together. We'd do, do some things together, but it was never close. It was extremely surfacy, very surfacy. And I think I asked him one time, you know, why do you think mom died? And he kind of jumped around the subject a bit. I told him what I thought. I thought she died because you left and she didn't know what to do. She didn't know you were the breadwinner. <laughs> she, she didn't know how to work. She didn't know how to do anything. I mean, she was an artist. She could go and paint and do stuff like that, but to, to sustain your family on just that was tough. It didn't end great with my dad. He was sick. He had cancer as well. And, uh, um, I just, it just, it kind of went away. It just went away. I've gotten closure, uh, uh, with my mom going to her, uh, I guess mausoleum you'd call it, and just asking her all kinds of questions. <laughs> you know, why? Why didn't you let us help you? This, uh, all these things, all these questions. Um, that maybe I'll get the answer to later. I certainly started to close off the world and get very, very deep into music and let uh, my, my feelings out through music. I would hear songs and understand that they're talking to me, they're communicating with me, they understand me. And that, that was where I started to connect to music deeply. My family fell apart, so I created my own family with the band. And then Cliff goes, and that was another extremely tough time. Early Saturday morning, September 27th, 1986, on the road near Jungby, Sweden, Cliff Burton died. He was 24 years old. He just got thrown out the window, and boom, the bus landed on him, and basically, by all accounts, I mean, he never woke up. Drinkers we were, we went back to the hotel and just drank, 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 you know? I remember at four o'clock in the morning, I could hear James down on the street, drunk, screaming, Cliff, Cliff, where are you? And when I heard that, I just, you know, I just broke into tears, you know? Within hours, news of Cliff's death reached Metallica's fans in America. I would say uh, that Cliff passing didn't, uh, well, yes, it, it really reopened that whole wound of abandonment of anyone I'm kind of going to get close to is just going to leave. Uh, and it's better maybe to not put your heart out there. I see how I gathered up some of those tools and used them later on to, you know, the mighty Hetfield speaks or something, you know, stand back, don't get close, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a rock, I'm immovable, you know, I've got no emotion. Uh, and, uh, and that was the easy way to not get close to anybody. And yeah, I still struggle with that, you know, wanting to just stop the world. Okay, you get there, you get there, you know, the total control aspect of it. On stage was it, it an easy persona to put on. It's a jacket that I could wear easily because of my past wounds. And I could get up there and play the victim and, and you know, back off, get away from me. And, uh, uh, but when I took that off, it was still there. There's an integrity to part of that that I believe, but most of it is, is the shield. It's the shield to keep people back. I'll die if I let go. Control is love. Love is control. I will only let you breathe my air that you receive. Then we'll see if I let you love me. 
I try to write about something and it morphs into this other thing. And that is the gift part that I believe. That's, it's, it's, it's allowing me to uh, get the stuff out yeah. that's still sitting in there. It's no good to you until you discover it yourself, you know? So sitting there, uh, you know, soapboxy writing lyrics about, okay, your dad left and now do this for yourself and blah, blah, blah. No one's going to relate to that. They're going to want to relate to the struggle and know that there's someone out there helping speak about this. Wounds are good fodder for lyrics, man. They're a, they're a great thing to write about. And it's, it's, it's your story. You know, I'm getting, to, I'm getting to write my story and people listening to it. What do you think the most personal track is to you? Unforgiven. With time the child draws in, this whipping boy done wrong, deprived of all his thoughts, the young man struggles on and on and no. Our kids have no choice on how good a parent we're going to be. I'm going to be there um, because of what's happened in my past. I've had to learn how to love the family. I really have because it didn't come easy. I, I fought it. I fought it for a while. I think once I started yelling at my kids and laying down the hammer and I just, oh, whoa, that's what my dad would do. I got to stop that. And what really has helped me a lot with forgiving my dad or letting that go is, is just rewinding into his childhood and seeing he was raised on a farm with a bunch of women, you know? He didn't have a father figure, his dad wasn't around. I had to realize that the world does not revolve around James Hetfield and that I get a lot more grat gratification out of hanging out with my family than I do with anybody else. Big eyes to open soon, believing all under sun and moon. But does heaven know you're here? And did they give you smiles or tears? No, no tears. Mm. Well, I always, I always say I want to, I want to make it to Grandpa, where I can just sit there and have all the little ones run around and oh yeah. Grandpa Het, how's it going? And you know, and pull my finger, all that good stuff, you know. I I definitely want that. I want to be the patriarch of the family and feel like I'm I can be I can be loved by them. And I can answer any no matter how silly the question is, I can I'll take time to answer that. That's what I'd love to do to my kids, grandkids, great grandkids, who knows? That's the love part of this world, and I want to see more of that. Yeah.